So I was thinking about the Jets yesterday, so I was uh, calling around just to kind of get a sense of, like, how, how did we get to this point with this franchise? And what happened? And what was uh, or what were, you know, what are the timeline of, of the decisions that have been made here? And, and who is ultimately responsible and uh, for where we are today? So there's a lot of decisions that were made from 2015 to 2020. And, you know, it all started with, you know, jettisoning uh, the, the Mike Tannenbaum and, um, and Rex Ryan and bringing in Mike McCagnan and, of course, Todd Bowles and bringing them in separately uh, and, and having that, that kind of like that V-shape where they both can go to the owner and talk to the owner where they both have the same amount of power. But one controls the roster and the coaching staff. And the other just coaches the team and, dep- and decides on who, who's going to play in the game on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, or Thursday, right? Yeah. So looking back at some of these decisions and how they manifested themselves from draft picks to free agent signings to ultimately getting where we are today with today's coaching staff, it, <laughs> it, it, is, it, is, it is about as dysfunctional at it, as it gets, and you've put people together – that really don't want to be together and probably uh, are together simply because everybody was trying to save their own ass or get a job uh, wherever they could get a job. And that's what's going on now with the, with the coaches for the Jets. You know, they're all trying to figure out where their next job is going to be. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. Cause it's not going to be here. So they don't want to be the last rat on the Titanic. They need to get off. Right. Right. And, 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 uh, you know, personally, if it were me and I were the head coach, or if it were me and I were the general manager, the first guy I'd kick in the ass and get him out of the building is Greg Williams. Because what Greg Williams did to the team and what he did to Adam Gase was a disgrace in my eyes. And I said that I said that when we, when we came in here yesterday uh, or Monday, and I'm going to say it again today. And the more I delve into all of this, the more I hate what he did. And how he did it. And, you know, you're all in this together. And, I, and I've lived through years like this. So I've walked a mile in these men's shoes. So I know exactly what's going on here. And I've done it here. I've, ha- I've had to endure it here. And I've had to listen to what they're listening to now, what their families are listening to now, what I'm sure their wives and their kids are, you know, just horrified by listening to Jet Fan after Jet Fan after Jet Fan and host here on this radio station uh, you know, and writers and everybody else in social media just absolutely hammering most likely what are pretty decent people. But unfortunately, their record doesn't doesn't reflect, you know, how nice of people they may be. All, all, all we care about in the sports world is results and the results speak for themselves. And they're really they're ugly results. So I, w- I was just thinking back to towards the end of the Todd Bowles era and looking back at some of the free agent signings, looking back at some of the, the horrific draft picks that were made, the guys sure. that were yeah. jettisoned out of here, guys that never showed up, guys that never ended up playing, guys that ended up getting huge contracts. Oh, Tremaine Johnson comes right yeah. to mind. Ex- yeah. Exactly. Well, Le'Veon Bell is another one with a huge well, contract. Yeah, of course, I mean, yeah. you know, yep. Even C.J. Mosley got a huge yeah. contract, and they got, what, two games out of him. So yep. there, there were all these mistakes that were made, and a lot of these mistakes were – made by Christopher Johnson, because I'm telling you that the Christopher Johnson that I know personally is a guy who wants to win desperately for the fan base. I know that. I know that from talking to him. I know that from being around him. I know that from watching him and how much this pains him. That may not make Jet fans feel any better. I'm just telling you personally what I think about, you know, what he has tried to do here. And he 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 basically made a mess of this by the way that he went about this hiring for Adam Gase. Yeah. And the reason for that is because he decided to keep Mike McCagnan. And once Mike McCagnan was in the loop and involved by making decisions, I personally believe, and I can't corroborate this, but I, I do believe that this is the case. And, and And this is my personal opinion here. So I don't want to, you know, throw anybody under the bus. I'm not trying to say that I have inside information, but everything, every everybody that I talked to yesterday, I was trying to put together these pieces of how the hell this coaching staff got put together, and one thing just kept coming back, and the fact that Greg Williams is here, he was hired by Mike McCagnan. He was not hired by Adam Gase, to, to the best of my knowledge, and he wouldn't be hired by Adam Gase because. Adam Gase's father-in-law is Joe Vitt. 
And yep. as I understand it, Joe Vitt and Greg Williams can't stand each other. Yet. <laughs> because of what happened in New Orleans? Because of what happened in New Orleans. And yeah. and, and basically, Adam Vitt was, uh, 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 Joe Vitt Joe was Vitt. brought here. Yep. Joe Vitt was brought here by Adam Gase. And I, and I understand why Adam Gase would do that. I would want a guy that I could trust, my father-in-law, on the defensive staff to make sure that I have my best interests at heart and I know what the hell's going so, on in that room. So let me ask you, this was the reason that Mike McCagnan was given the power to bring in Greg Williams was to sort of appease him in a way because he really didn't make the head coaching hire because he wanted to hire well, somebody else well, and Christopher I, I, Johnson vetoed that? I'm telling you, they, they, they were inches away from hiring Matt Rule and told Matt Rule was told he can't hire his own coaching staff. And Matt Rule. Well, that's got to be the dumbest thing. And, well, well, I mean, but, I, but I'm just saying. But I. So this is basically what I was going through yesterday because I'm just going like, why is this happening? I have never heard of a defensive coordinator. I, I've heard of coaches throwing a player under the bus or a particular part of the team under the bus, but I've never heard a, a defensive assistant go after you know the the head coach the way that it, it felt like Greg Williams was going after. Adam Gase, it just felt it felt wrong. It felt like it was uh, a violation of the unwritten rules and the code of coaches on the same staff. And well, it's because I, they had no prior relationship. They had no reason to trust one another. Things were going horribly wrong. Adam Gase wasn't the guy who brought him in, so it wasn't like he was thankful for that. Yeah, I mean, you could see so, how that happens because of the situation uh, that got both of them here. Right. So so then Adam Gase does bring in Dowell Loggins. He does bring in uh, Joe Vitt with himself. You know, these are guys that are Adam Gase guys. He has to accept Half of a uh, you know a, a coaching staff that he probably didn't want in the first place. One of the reasons Matt Rule isn't here, um, and it, it it just turns out you're putting people together that if you know the history of these people, and this is where Christopher Johnson comes in. You know, for whatever reason, Christopher Johnson was smitten by Adam Gase because Adam Gase gets fired out of Miami and immediately comes for the Jet job because you know look there aren't many of these jobs. You know, right. so I was told yesterday by somebody there, you know, there are a hundred U.S. senators. There's only 32 NFL owners and 32 head coaches. It is a very it's a premium job when you get it. And if you win like an Andy Reid's winning or a John Harbaugh's winning or a Bill Belichick's winning, it's one of the greatest jobs in the history of sports because you're with a collection of men and you're, you're watching them grow together and you're you're trying to accomplish something together that's very difficult. And when you have the level of success that those three coaches have had, it, it doesn't get any better than that. Unfortunately, the rest of the coaches are all kind of in a blender uh, and they just get shuffled around the deck. And, and they are so insecure about their jobs that they sometimes take jobs that they shouldn't have taken. So it, in, in, in retrospect, if, if Adam Gase was really confident in himself and knew who he was and knew what he was stepping into, he should have never taken this job under the, the the circumstances that they were that it was offered to him, right? Just like Matt Rule said no, and then he was going to go to a place where there was an owner there, and David Tepper was going to do whatever it took to get him. He gave him a massive salary. He was allowed to hire his own coaching staff. You know, sometimes you know, if you like you said, if you believe in yourself and you feel like you're going to have that shot, like Matt Rule did, he waited it out. And now he's in a better situation. Yeah, I don't, but I don't, I don't blame Matt Rule. Also, didn't get fired right away. That's the other thing. It's a lot easier to wait it out when you're in a place where you know you can succeed in college to get that other job as opposed to Adam Gase who thinks somebody's going to hire me two days after I get fired. I might as well take this job as opposed to not having my name in the mix anywhere. Well, I, I, I look, I don't I don't blame Adam Gase for taking the job. Hell, you know, it's one of 32. It's a huge job. And he had just gotten fired. Right. And he probably was in the throes of trying to figure out what's going on in Miami. And, of course, Steve Ross said, no, nope, you're out of here. Goodbye. And he wanted to probably come to New York in the same division and, and show Stephen Ross that, you know, they chose the wrong guy on Brian Flores. But now, as it turns out, it looks like Brian Flores has got his team on the right track. They're going to start two and everything else. So I'm, let me just go back to all of this, this other stuff. So, so Mike McCagnan, you know, decides that Greg Williams is going to be the defensive coach. He's going to be the defense coordinator. He wants a personality in there. He wants somebody that's tough, somebody that has a track record. And I don't want to take away from Greg Williams' track record. I mean, you know, it speaks for itself. But what he did the last few days in, in just kind of like – and the way that we perceive it in the media and the way that it's written and the way that we take it, it's just another one of these, oh, God, I can't believe the Jets are going through this crap again. This is why they're so dysfunctional because the defense coordinator is calling out the offense and the, and, and the head coach. Uh, so then 
what what happens next? What happens next is that, you know, whether it be Christopher Johnson or whether it be Adam Gase telling Christopher Johnson that there's no way that he could work with Mike McCagnan and Mike McCagnan's got to go. Mike McCagnan ends up getting fired after they finally convince Joe Douglas, who turned this job down I, at least twice. They finally convince him with a six year deal that he has to come here. And and I believe that Adam Gase had a lot to do with that simply because he probably felt like, you know what? I got Greg Williams in this building. I got Joe Vitt in this building. I got Dal Loggins in this building. If I can just get another guy in this building that I think has gotten my back, well, you know, sure. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be somewhat safe because I can't believe that Mike McCagnan is going to make me or I took this job. So it's my decision to work right. with Greg Williams. So uh, after, you know, much cajoling and, you know, offering different contracts and finally coming up with a six-year deal, Joe Douglas reluctantly, I believe, Again, I believe this. I don't know this to be true, but it seems to be after talking with everybody I talked to yesterday, reluctantly takes this job after getting a six year offer. So he's safe. He's the safe guy. But now he's boxed in a corner because the fan base is just absolutely livid as to what's going on. They have a young quarterback that has not developed, who's obviously hurt. They have a lifeless, listless team. And the coach doesn't have answers. And by the way, the coach doesn't help himself with the way that he gives answers. So we find ourselves in the middle of this mess. And by the way, Joe Douglas, I don't necessarily know that he realized it until he got here. He was the one who inherited this unique kind of way of doing things and the wacky way that these people came together. So I may be off a little bit. I, I, I just reading the tea leaves and talking to the people that I talked to yesterday, I just think that this whole thing from the get-go was a mess. And if, if they just would have hired Adam Gase and said, okay, Adam, you hire your coaching staff and you bring your guys in here, it would have been a much better thing for Adam as a head coach as opposed to jumping to the next job because – in their well, DNA, they have major insecurities, G. I'm telling you, the coaches yeah. in this league have major insecurities. Well, obviously. I mean, when you work at a place where there's constant change all the time, it's always going to be in but the back every, of your it's head. Every, it's a pretty right, much that's what I'm team. saying. Uh, but I know, but you're also working for an organization in the Jets where you feel like you got a year or two to figure it out. And even some of these head coaches in the past have had a good first year and then it's fallen apart and there's a million other changes that happen after that. I mean, of course that's going to be in your head. You can't blame anybody for that. But the biggest mistake was, and I know I wasn't the only one that was saying it at the time because it was pretty obvious to me, was keeping Mike McCagnan when they hired Adam Gates and letting him go through that offseason. It was the biggest offseason the Jets had had in a long time because they were building up to that point. They had already gone through a rebuild. They had the most cap space out of anybody. They had just drafted Sam Darnold, and it was that 2019 draft class where Mike McCagnan felt like he had to use that money because the heat was on him. He survived the firing of Todd Bowles. He was still there, and he had to do something big and the big was cj mosley Le'Veon bell and it just ended up being a mess for him and the draft class wasn't really even that good either that year so nobody really does that nobody has a general manager go through a draft and a free agent class that was that important and fire him a couple of weeks later yeah, it's the, just well, insanity and the, and the problem is is that you know christopher johnson hadn't been through this this was his first time being through this and you know whether you want to say he was, you know, hoodwinked by Mike McCagnan or, you know, Mike just, you know, had, you know, an opportunity to talk to an owner straight to, you wow. know, face to face and convinced him to let him do this. But uh, once Christopher decided that it was going to be Adam Gase, what was already here was going to you are now adding this personality to a very toxic situation because of the defense coordinator that was here. I believe that I believe that's how this whole thing went down. Um, I, I and the fact that, you know, you have Adam Gase's father-in-law on the staff, you know, and and I, I would think that two guys from their New Orleans days probably get along great. And, and I believe that Joe Vitt is a great guy. He's got great, impeccable reputation in this league and everybody loves the guy. Um, but the fact that now he has to share the same defensive room as the guy that ultimately, you know, his his testimony, I believe, in that whole uh, Bounty Gate thing basically cost Greg Williams a significant you know, I mean, hit to his reputation and, and money and fines and everything else. 
you you're, you're asking for a combustible situation and then oh sure well you, you right. said that at the time just with the personalities uh, yes. i mean you had the extra layer of how they hated each other from that but just their personalities so i i, I guess you know you when it all goes back to it all goes back to the, the, the uh, number of decisions that christopher johnson made and i don't i, I have no idea you know who was uh advising him i'm not i'm not really sure but he was a novice in this world he made these decisions and he put the wrong people together, the wrong, you know. Now, I think Joe Douglas is the right person. I really do. And, yeah. I, and I want to give him a chance. I mean, like, he, his draft class. Well, he'll I, get his chance, yeah. He, well, he needs chance. to have his chance. But yeah. he he needs to be the guy that runs the entire organization. He needs to be the man. Well, I isn't he a, at this point now? I mean, isn't he? I, yeah, I, I, we'll find out when he hires the next coach. Well, we'll find out. I, I now, now here's the other part of this that I, I I'm still trying to figure out, and and I don't necessarily know that if they sat down with Christopher Johnson and they said to, when when Joe Douglas finally took the job, and and he and Adam Gase sat down with Christopher Johnson and they sat there and they spoke about this upcoming season, the 2020 season, because when you look at the Jets and you look at their roster, they have. 28 guys right now that are on one-year contracts. 28 guys. And when you give a guy a one-year contract, that's basically like, hey, we, you know, we just need a guy. We need a guy in a uniform. And we need you to go out there. And if you have some experience, you maybe you can make some plays. You know, we'll be, this is like we are in the middle of, and everybody should be aware of this, a total redo. This is what oh, a yeah. redo looks like, and right. it is ugly. And when you look at the, the roster, the way it's constructed, you look at the contracts that are out there, You have we all have to recognize that it's a rebuild. Now, the, and remember, Joe Douglas is here because he is an ally of Adam Gase. I, I don't care what anybody says. They, were, they, they knew each other in Chicago. I'm sure Adam Gase was pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing because he didn't like the way things were already unfolding here as the head coach. It just took him a while to get here to be able to feel comfortable enough to bitch about it to the to the owner. And then the owner ended up doing something and they finally convinced Joe Douglas to get here. So I, I, I it's just a collection of people that just don't work well together. Probably uh, there's a lot of tension in that building and it spills out over into the, the public domain. It creates even more tension, even more problems. For the head coach, because it makes him look like he is way in over his head, and yeah. it's not a good look, and it's not. But a he's good also feel. got he's also got a really bad personality for a situation like this. You know, he's prickly. He's got the chip on his shoulder. He's not a great communicator. He's not someone who seems to get along with players wherever he is. Like maybe a guy here or there ends up liking him. But like in a situation where everything is burning around you, there are actually coaches that can navigate that. Okay, now nobody does it well, but there's some coaches that can get through that because of their personality, because they believe in themselves, because whatever reason it is. Adam Gase isn't one of those guys. Adam Gase is just... When things are going bad, he makes them worse. He's the guy that brings the gasoline to the fire. He's the guy that brings the match to the pile of leaves. And ultimately, and ultimately it does stop at his desk. But in, in this case, I mean, the the first thing that I would have done, and I know that they've had this conversation, and, um, I, you know, we saw them talking before the game on the field that wasn't what everybody thought it was because there's no, there's no way that Adam Gase and Greg Williams are walking onto a football field where there are TV cameras and everybody's going to you know, try to put words in their mouth, the discussion that they're having before the game against the Dolphins. And that had nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Yeah. That, had, well, that, was, all, that was all game related. But I, to me, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, one of these guys has got to go. I, yeah, I don't know how you can ask these people to work together if they're not getting along. And, well, both of them are going to be gone at the end of the year, so what's the difference about, at this point? I, well, I'll tell you, you know what? It's like coming to work with somebody you don't like to work with. You yeah. know, I mean, and there have been millions of people out there right now that are listening to us that understand what I'm saying. Like, if you don't yeah. like the guy that you go to work with and, and you need to count on that guy, uh, you know, in, in the worst of times, this is absolutely the worst of times for for a particular football team that may go down, that may go down as the worst team in the history of the league. Think about that for a second. Yeah, I know. I've been saying it for the whole entire week. Yeah, yeah I okay. I know, but I'm just saying, but that's how bad it is. We can laugh at it. We don't live it. I've lived on bad football teams, and I'm telling yeah. you, it absolutely, it sucks. It really yeah. does suck. And I feel, I feel for the coaches and I feel for the players because they think that they're putting their time and effort in. 
But when you look at this roster, 28, 28 one-year contracts, uh, you know, they have to decide at the end of this year, do they pick up the fifth-year option of Sam Darnold? That's most likely not going to happen if they get the number one overall pick. And then you have uh, Roddy White, the ex-wide uh, receiver of the Atlanta Falcons, basically telling Trevor Lawrence either stay in school or don't well, come to the Jets. You know, so you're going to start getting a lot well, of that now. Well, obviously, because they think that they might have a shot at the, well, maybe not this year if you told them to stay in school. But, I mean, whatever. You're going to hear a lot of that. You heard a lot of that with the Bengals. You hear a lot of it with every team that's terrible. Uh, and we haven't seen it in a very long time since Eli Manning. So I, I thought there was a good chance with Joe Burrow because of what I had heard from Carson Palmer. That didn't happen. you got to remember, too, if Trevor Lawrence has a coach here that he believes in, that is going to wipe out all the other stuff. The reason why the Jets are a laughing stock right now is because mostly because of Adam Gase. If you get a trusted and respected head coach or somebody who's like that next offensive genius and Trevor Lawrence wants to play there, and by the way, it is still the biggest market in the country, I'm sorry. I still think that he will he will be a Jet. And I also think the NFL hates that stuff, too. I really do. Sure Not they Rod- do. They don't, want, like, they, they don't want to have any of these deal with that. undercut. Right, right. exactly. And I, and I bet you I wouldn't be surprised if Roger Goodell or someone from the NFL or representation there talked to Trevor Lawrence and said, hey, do me a favor. Whoever drafts you, can you go there? Because we don't need any sort of nonsense. You know, and the other, the other thing that the Jets now have to deal with is, you know, you had Jamal Adams leave. You have Le'Veon Bell gone. Both of those players are on potential playoff teams. Um, both of those players, you know, w- when Jamal gets healthy, he'll be like front and center on that uh, uh, Seattle defense. And you're gonna, we're gonna watch, you know, Le'Veon Bell in a couple weeks here, assuming that he knows the offense and gets through oh, their yeah. first game against Denver. Fine, we're gonna see him go off against the Jets. You just know that's gonna of happen, course. and yep. that's gonna make that's gonna make matters even worse. Yeah, and, and that's and that's really. I, I here's the one question that I have. Uh, uh, Geo is the fact that if if Adam Gase and Joe Douglas sat down with the owner and said, "Look, this this place is a mess right now, and we have to get rid of players, and we have to clean this up, and we need your support and your patience to allow us to do what we think we can do to set this franchise up long term," then then you know then the question comes down to you know. Is Adam Gase going to be fired? I, oh, stop. Come on. You can't possibly paint a scenario where Adam Gase stays, can you? There's no I, way. I, I, I please, I, please. There's I'm no not, way. I'm not advocating for it, um, I, and I know. I know you're not, but there's just there's still no way. You've said it days leading up to this, that it just gets to a point where it's about business. Now, I understand they had a previous relationship, but, I mean, <laughs> They're not competing at all, I know, and I understand there's no roster, but it, my Lord, you cannot keep him. When I, no when way. I, when no, I, no, when no. I, when I look at this, I just look at a, a total cluster, you know what, of, yeah. of decision-making that took place at the, at the end of the Todd Bowles era. Uh, you know, to me, the, the decisions and the way that they were made, the way that they were put in place, and the people that they put together, you know, were not going to have success, especially with the roster as barren as it was, and with the free agent signings that Mike uh, McCagnan ultimately ultimately made and the amount of money he spent well, on listen. guys that are just not on the team, whether yeah. it be C.J. Mosley opting out, whether it be Tremaine Johnson, whether it be Le'Veon Bell. I mean, that, that's like, that, that gets people fired. Yeah, you want a surefire way to have Trevor Lawrence go back to school or pull an Eli Manning is keep Adam Gase here. That's, that's your way. Because the team's probably going to go 0-16. They'll be the worst team in football. They'll get the number one overall pick. You want to make sure that he doesn't come to the Jets? Keep Adam Gase around. That is That will be the absolutely perfect thing to get Trevor Lawrence to give the Heisman pose to the New York Jets. And just one thing on Christopher Johnson. I know you've talked to him more than I have, but I've sat down with him a couple of times. He seems like a guy that wants to trust and believe in everybody that's sitting in front of him. And that can be a good quality in certain situations. I think it's a bad quality when you're trying to make major high-level decisions in the NFL. And I think that Mike McCagnin, he had a relationship with him. He wanted to believe in him, and he kept him after Todd Bowles, and he felt bad firing both those guys. And I think McCagnin convinced him that, hey, I could do this. I could stay here. Let's work together. And unfortunately, he gave him a shot, and he wasn't ruthless. Like you say, these guys have to be ruthless and make these decisions at this high level. And then Adam Gase came in, having been fired, and he fell for that whole bill of goods as well. And then Peyton Manning called him, and he got all excited. And how was that? So I mean, that's the other thing. You know, the moment that Peyton called is the moment that everything changed. And 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 Peyton has influence, and and I understand why. 
Um, you know, he's an iconic player. He's a player that is uh, uh, just the, the respect for him and, and the way he does things is just um, it's off the charts by every owner. And I think Christopher Johnson was smitten by that. I really do. And, yeah. and Adam Gase may have been a great coach for, uh, for Peyton Manning, but maybe Adam Gase needs that personality to uh, of Peyton Manning to coach, you know, I, I, so, and he doesn't have that and he didn't have it in Miami. And that's one of the reasons why I think there's, there's, there's failure that's associated with yeah. him and double digit failure, which is really, I mean, it's, it's bad. So I, 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 I I just, I know there's no way that Adam, and, and you just pointed something out. There's no way that Adam Gase can stay here. And the reason for that is because of what you just said. If, if Trevor Lawrence is coming out and he is the number one pick and Adam Gase is the head coach, yeah, and with all it. of this negativity around Adam, whether it be in Miami or whether it be here, and it's louder here than it's ever been before, there's no way that that kid is going to want to play for this franchise. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the red bell so you're notified when we have new content.